So I want to talk today about adapting AppSec. Um, this is me. As Jim said, I've been around for a while. Uh, I've worked with quite a few people in this field. Yeah, don't yell at me for having lets and vars in the same. That's actually Swift. Someone yelled at me, and no, that's not JavaScript. Uh, so I'm now at Contrast Security. I'm our director of AppSec. Uh, yes, we're uh, an application security software company, but uh, we still need AppSec uh, for our products and whatever else. Um, I'm a dad. I golf, or I try to golf. Uh, I'm really interested in IoT and mobile, so I kind of do some of that on the side now. Um, so that's me in a nutshell. Um, so I want to dig right in, right? Uh, the rules of the game have kind of changed. You know, I've been in AppSec. I still remember, I think it was 2002, I took an AppSec course from Jeff Williams, who was one of the co-founders of OWASP. Um, so it's been a while. Uh, so I've seen it change over the years. But the last year and a half, two years, it's really, really changing. And business is changing, right? I mean, business success is, is really dependent on developing great software anymore. I mean, there's like 23 million professional developers in the world. That was the last number I saw. And, and I don't know how they determine that, but I assume that means that these people are writing code all day, every day, right? Um, so things are changing. Software is being built. It's great. It's huge. There's billions and billions of lines of code, and we're building them faster. Um, so over time, we've seen it go from very monolithic apps. Who still has these, by the way? Yeah, everyone still does, right? Um, to more agile, where there's like end tiers, and you know, maybe you're getting into some of the VMs and, and you know, spinning things up and, and breaking them down. And now this whole DevOps thing, uh, microservices, containers, clouds, uh, it's, it's gotten crazy, but I mean, honestly, most of it is kind of a mix of these. Like, you like, like Wagile Ops, right? Like, or Wagile Fall or something, right? Like, I don't think anyone's truly one or the other of these, um, except for maybe some really bleeding edge new stuff. Um, so what hasn't changed, though? Because in AppSec, like I said, it's, it's been around for a while, um, you know, and, and things have changed in development space. Things have changed in AppSec. But what hasn't? Uh, well, Tiger's still the goat, right? <laughs> right? So old things still work, right? Um, but there are quite a few things that, that really haven't changed in this space. Uh, we still need exec level support. Hands down, they're the ones paying the paychecks, they're the ones handing out money to make sure that their products are sold, bought, and, and whatever else, right? So we need that support, and that won't change over time. Uh, we still need programs with governance, people, process, tools, right? Again, that's something that won't change. Uh, collaborative relationships, we're getting better at that, right? And I'll talk about some of that as I go on. Um, that hasn't changed. You know, specific things to uh, different control areas, those still exist, right? Some frameworks, some tooling, some whatever else may make them easier, but those things are still issues and things we have to think about. The need for threat models, secure design, it's, it's almost more imperative now as disparate as these systems are getting, right, with all the different microservices. I mean, I've seen, I was going to show you, uh, so we just started a bug bounty, <laughs> and I was going to show you the environment that we set up just for the bug bounty, and it's really simple. All it does is people log into Cognito, and it spins up a Docker image running WebGoat in our, our tool, right? That sounds simple, but there's like 40 different parts on this, this diagram. Uh, to that simple process, right? Uh, so it's imperative we start doing these more uh, because I've had people tell me that we don't need to do threat modeling, we don't need to do secure design. And there is that camp out there, but I'm in the camp that believes that I think we do. Um, and we're still writing code, right? So security standards. <sighs> who, who has security standards for AppSec? Can I ask those of you who didn't raise your hand, why not? I like it to be interactive, so you know, yell at me, throw things at me, I don't care. No one? <laughs> there we go. All right, Any, anyone? Sure. Well, 
something that developers know to use. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I asked him to. Uh, something that developers can look at, use, understand. Like, hey, for authentication, you use this framework, you use this tool set, right? Okay. Neil, were you going to say something? Yeah, it doesn't have, I, I'm not saying like, you know, crazy old standard process docs that no one wants to read, right? But there, there has to be an understanding of these different control areas and how developers should approach them in their code, right? Um, application risk categorization. I, I can guarantee you that no more than 20% of you do this. Like this, this has been the hardest thing to do for organizations as time has gone on. I mean. You know, some of, the, some of the companies that I've worked over time, I mean, they've got 3,000, 5,000 different apps. Where do, you, where do you even start, right? But we have to. I mean, OWASP has ASVS, right? But if you don't know the risk categorization of your app, you're not sure which path to follow as far as how you assess your apps and, and the, the security posture of that app. And secure design principles. So I want to talk about this a little bit. Does anyone use Ghost? No one? the popular node blogging platform. All right, so these guys pissed me off. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about this a bit. <laughs> um, so they have a set, and this, this is all on their site, of five different user roles. And I've got those there, right? Contributors, authors, editors, administrators, and owners. They all have different things they can do and things they can't do. Well, my esteemed colleague found that you can easily elevate your privilege in this system. Um, and they have an open bug bounty, so he submitted that to them, I think it was July of last year. Never responded, not once, to him. Um, all he had to do was embed some JavaScript in an app and get an admin to preview it. So there's like a CSRF thing and all that going on. But it was really easy to do. So Ghost's response, not to Matt, was to change their documentation. They're not interested in privilege escalation. They sell this tool, right? And they say right here, this is, this is the part that's crazy. Ghost is a content management system and all users are considered to be privileged and trusted. Really? Like, wh what year is it? Do we, do we create access control systems and then just say, no, we don't really need that, everyone's trusted anyway? So, it's stuff like this, like they didn't use secure design principles here, right? Like which ones are they missing here? Least privilege is the obvious one, right? Maybe separation of duties? I mean, that was the whole point of this, is to kind of separate the duties of the different roles of users. But obviously, they, it's, it's over their head. So if you use it, press them on this, please. Their fix is basically putting it on the users of the system. Hey, you should run the admin interface on a separate domain. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you should, but that shouldn't be the fix to this. And then software integrity. Like, this is becoming more and more of importance with all of the third-party library issues we've seen, right? Um, does anyone use Ruby? <laughs> Come on, Ruby guys, right? I, I know get, everyone from GitHub better raise their hand. Uh, so there was recently the Bootstrap uh, SAS Ruby gem issue. Did people see that in the news? Uh, so someone, I don't know if they've really come out and said who or how or what, committed this code, which basically just took in a fake HTTP header and evaled it. And I don't know if you know Ruby, but that's just metaprogramming. You can pretty much do everything, right? Uh, and it was committed to uh, a, an older version of this gem. Uh, thankfully, I, I don't know who the guy is, but he called it out when he saw it committed, even though it was an older version. But it was something that was downloaded about 1,500 times. Yeah. 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 It was. It, it was interesting, right? Um, so, I mean, simple things like that. It, this stuff is happening, right? And this can happen in your code, too. So we, we've got to have some process around how we're determining the integrity of our software. And threat modeling. 
you know, no one likes it. It sounds like a four-letter word. Who, who does threat modeling? That's awesome. Do you make it fun, at least? Right? Because if you don't, no one's going to want to do it. Like, talk in Batman terms or something, right? Uh, make it fun. Make it quick. And, and I'll talk about some of that as well. So those are the things that haven't really changed, in my opinion. Uh, things that have changed are arc patterns, right? Like, our architectures are drastically different. Um, development methodologies over time have changed for sure. The speed of development, you know, it's, it's only increasing. It's crazy how much code developers can write. I think the last stat I saw is, like, the average developer writes about 10,000 lines of code a year. Um, I don't know how accurate that is, but that seems fairly, fairly accurate to me. Um, need for tooling and automation is only increasing because there's just too much code. Uh, new infrastructures and, and responsibilities are changing. And, and really, as a business, this is kind of key, right? Like, as a business, you're being pushed into writing modern software, using these modern architectures, right? It's not as easy just to stand up an antiquated Java system anymore, right? Like, where are you going to put it? Who's going to host it? Uh, can, can, we, can we not have deployment parties that last two days, right? Like, like things are changing. Uh, you know, agile, DevOps, microservices, all that stuff. But the harsh reality is, this is like every year. The number one security threat is application code breaches. I don't see that changing anytime soon, right? I mean, the amount of code we're writing, you know, infrastructure as code, you know, all of that good stuff coming in, uh, it's not going to change. But we're still seen as the slowdowns, like us security folks, right? Developers are like, oh, you're slowing us down, right? So 72% of developers say, you know, that's really the slowdown. Um, and then what's the big deal on the security exec side, right? Talent shortage. So <laughs> we, we have some, some, some issues to deal with in this, this modern era uh, of, of development and securing development. Because developers are being asked to basically continue speeding up their process, writing more code, delivering almost 10 times the amount of code, right? And we still have to make sure that that code is secure. So how are we going to do that? It's, it's almost an impossible economic thing, right? Like, like we, have, we have tools. We have very teeny budgets, right? Uh, we have some specialized security staff. But then we're writing that much more code, right? I mean, this, this is real. Like, who else is seeing this? Right? We don't have time, you know, 20 years ago when I started in consulting, it was really easy. Hey, we have this huge monolithic Java app. It's 7 million lines of code. Can you look at it for six months? Sure. We don't have that anymore, right? I've got these 300 microservices written in 17 different languages. And how are you going to assess them all? Oh, and by the way, I don't really have a proof of concept. They just, some of them are HTTP, some of them are exposed through API Gateway, and it's like, holy crap. Like, like how are we going to do this? So the, the root of the problem really stems back to we're using an antiquated security model for trying to secure modern day applications. You know, we're using the old scan and perimeter based model with SAS, DAST, you know, uh, dynamic scanners, uh, WAFs, all of that stuff, and we're having issues, right? Those tools, all that good stuff was built for kind of the pre-cloud era. It really was. I'm not saying they're bad. Tools are great. Like, everyone should use them. Uh, you have to use them. Uh, but we're kind of stuck in this, this slump, if you will. And I think we need to get over blaming speed. Right? That's, that's the easy thing for me. Oh, it's, it's just too fast. Well, fucking catch up. Right? <laughs> like, I mean, they're not slowing down. They're not gonna. And they're gonna drive right over us as security folks if we don't keep up with them. Right? We don't, we, we're not building moats anymore. You know, 
we've got these high-speed airplanes coming at us, and you know, we gotta figure out how to help secure them. Um, so it kind of requires this modern software security model. Um, <laughs> who here can 100% accuracy tell me what their software security posture is? Or are you gonna hand me a report from six months ago? Because someone came in and looked at your code, right? right? Most of us cannot. And now we don't have slides. Oh, there they are. Hi, Kat. So this is kind of the, the way that, that we're trying to, to integrate, right? Like <laughs> security and dev are always like this. We're going in opposite directions. Who still has separate tracking systems? Like here's my security bugs in this directory over here. Here's my software bugs. Yeah, don't be shy. I know you do, right? Um, we're trying to get past that. Um, and then process integration. Like it's not, it's not this unicorn, right? <laughs> like, I mean, unicorns are great. Don't get me wrong. But it's really not, right? There, there's... If I could give you an easy button, I would, but there is no easy button. Every org is working differently. They all have different process. They all have different tools. So, you know, as a product security person, don't go in there thinking everything's gonna be, you know, rainbows and unicorns, because it's not gonna be, right? Some things are gonna integrate well, some things aren't. Maybe you'll have to reevaluate what tools you're using so they do integrate better. Um, but, you know, don't, don't come in there like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change the world. I got, I got a unicorn here. Um, and then this, this is huge, right? Like, I can't tell you the number of times I'm like seeing the, the old gray, gray beard, which is kind of like me, I guess I'm gray beard now, come in there, oh, you will do this. All right, well, I'm just gonna find a way around it, right? Uh, I have a story, it's funny, it's about my first job out of college. I had just gotten onto the security team. This is 20 some years ago, and old, old .NET, Java, I don't even remember what it was. It might have been Java, like COM plus. Um, but there were times that this app, the database would get corrupted for who knows what reason, right? So the developers would have to put in a request through email or something to our security team, and that would take two days for them to respond and give them access to go in and fix the prod database. So what do you think the developers did? Yeah, they wrote functionality in the app where they could just pass a SQL query in the URL, mind you, to fix the database. Because it happened frequently and no one could figure out why. But security got in the way and it took too long. It's like this app would be down for two days at a time, right? The business said, nope, figure out a way around it. So the developers did. And they're gonna continue to do that, right? So we gotta be very careful with, with gating. Um, and then relationships, right? <laughs> like, I was in consulting forever, so I understood that side of the relationship spectrum, right? Like, that relationship with my clients. Now I'm like internal. That's a whole different game for me, right? Like, my relationship building is not only with my devs, but with my product managers, right? The product managers are driving everything. So if I have a poor relationship with them, you think they're gonna do anything for me? Probably not, right? And then, you know, earlier I talked about threat modeling. Uh, I think there's this, this thing of like sprint threat modeling, not only like in your dev sprints, but doing it more quickly, right? Um, when it comes to, to threat modeling. And, and what I mean is, God, I hate clowns. <laughs> I don't even know why I'm like, scared looking at it. Every story should be examined for malfeasance. Doesn't matter what it is. Maybe you're only adding some drop-down box. It takes seconds to talk about it and examine that story for malfeasance, right? And for something that could possibly go wrong with, with that and, and, and some attacker getting after you. So then we, we've got this continuous integration, which is important. Everyone here probably uses it to some extent, right? What, what, what does this provide us, not only from a dev perspective, but from a security perspective? Come on, don't be shy. Yeah. 
I mean, it's really for speed, right? I mean, the old deploy parties, who was involved in those, by the way? Like, hey, you get to come in tonight and we'll give you beer, but you get to stay here all night while this deploys and fails and then you gotta fix it. Um, CI was added to help that issue, right? Like we can continually get those things moving. With security, we're like, ooh, we can get into that process, run some tests, not just unit tests, right? We can run security specific tests in our CIs, right? And then we get into con continuous delivery, right? Um, people get these a little confused. There's continuous delivery and continuous deployment. Can someone tell me the difference? Tanya. Sure, yeah, very good. I mean, uh, <laughs> sort of. Uh, so, so my answer is continuous delivery is, is basically all of, your deplo all, all of your builds could go to prod, but they don't necessarily all go to prod. Whereas continuous deployment is everything just goes to prod without approvals, as Tanya mentioned, right? Like every build just gets pushed to prod. I'm not sure how many people are actually doing the latter, there's probably a few. Um, but this is another place that we've been able to help inject some security process, uh, and should, right? Like, okay, we have a build, maybe we're running our SAS DAS tools at this point, right? We have a build that succeeds. So it is a near, new era though, right? Uh, software security is kind of falling behind. Uh, there aren't really great tools for the distributed systems that we're creating. And I say that as a tool vendor, right? Like, I, there, there's no magical unicorn answer as far as software security goes from a tooling perspective. Because there's a ton, right? I'm sure everyone uses some of these. Maybe they use them all, because you got unlimited funds, right? This isn't nearly all of them either, right? These are just ones that is like, oh, I've seen those, I've used those. Uh, and, and they all work in different places in the process, right? Uh, some may work better in your org, some may not. Uh, but, you know, setting them up uh, is, is definitely something that is part of your overall software security program. And then the streamlining piece. You know, I kind of talked about this earlier. Uh, you know, this looks very easy, right? You have your IDE, you have your code repos, you have your pipeline, and you have your hosting provider, which is probably a cloud. Uh, you know, some of you may still be on bare metal, but uh, the key here is they need to kind of all integrate into that single defect tracker, right? This defect tracker is where devs work. Day in and day out, that's how they know what they're supposed to do over the next couple of weeks or, or however long your sprints are, right? So if your security defects don't get into that defect tracker, devs aren't gonna pay them any attention, right? And in the same respect, if they are in the defect tracker, they'll be treated just as any other software security bug is, or not even security, but software bug is treated, right? And the criticality will be assigned and it just follows the process. This is, is key to make sure that your uh, security debt does not just continue to grow. You know, in my consulting days, I can't tell you the number of times I had clients come to me and say, all right, I got check marks in here, I ran it, and now I have a report and it's in this directory that no one looks at. Can you help me? I mean, yes, I can come in and help you and help maybe vet some of those, but you're not utilizing that investment correctly, right? <laughs> like, like, what's the point? Oh, I have the tool running. Right, but what are you doing with the output, right? Um, and, and this really helps too with all of the people in the org, right? Your developers are using that single defect tracker, your managers, who have to respond to the CISO when they say, hey, how many software security bugs do we have? Or how many did we fix over the last sprint? Uh, they can go to one single location and they know exactly how many, right? Security team's there and you're tooling. It's all pushing, pulling uh, from that single centralized tracking database. Is that you, Kenny? <laughs> uh, you know, and this is the hard part. This, this is what uh, I'm struggling with 
uh, and maybe someone has some insight here because this, this whole internal security, product security stuff is pretty new to me. Um, but as a security person, as a consultant, it's very easy to just be like, oh, hey, these things are bad and, and throw it over the window, right? Like, or throw it over the fence. Now, as a product security person, I'm like, oh, crap, they're bad, but how do I assign risk to that based on these 25 other things? right, that, that are ongoing, and maybe there's some revenue at risk, right? <laughs> like that's, that's definitely at play, right? Uh, so I, I don't have all the answers here, but you know, coming up with some sort of risk matrix makes sense, but it's not always gonna work. Just know that, right? Have at least a baseline, whether that's ASVS and have a feel for that, um, but, uh, yeah, and then DevSecOps, right? Like, I didn't want to go into this. This is a whole other topic. Three or four people have already talked about it, right? Uh, but I think it's very promising. Um, to me, what it really comes down to, and, and all of the things that I talked about are kind of put, putting that security culture out there, right? Like, being friends with people instead of sitting in your little basement dungeon telling people what to do, right? Understanding how much work it actually is gonna take for someone to make this fix versus this product enhancement that's gonna either bring in $8 million or not if we don't get it out the door right now, right? So all of those things start to get weighed uh, and, and, and it comes down to that building that security culture and, and the relationship building between the different areas. Um, so I wanted to talk about, how am I doing, I'm good, uh, how we, ship secure code, or at least semi-secure code, right? Um, it's not perfect. Uh, this is our process. These are the tools that we use. Uh, you know, the IDE, IntelliJ, uh, we have, we're Bitbucket. Uh, sorry, GitHub folks. <laughs> you know, it is what it is. Uh, right. Uh, so we use Bitbucket for, uh, our pipeline, we use it for our code repos. Uh, for chat ops, who doesn't use Slack nowadays, right? Like, yay Slack. Um, you know, and I love it, like all the integration points are amazing, especially for my bug bounty stuff. Um, we're building in some burp scans uh, with burp enterprise to, to scan all of our, our builds. Um, and we use Jira for tracking and uh, we, you know, this is a shameless plug, but we use our own tool on our own tool. It's contrast on contrast, you know, but hey, that's not gonna work for everyone. Um, so it's a pretty simple workflow, right? I mean, most people probably follow something similar. Maybe your tooling is in a different place. Um, you know, but I think the key here is it's pretty seamless, right? Uh, we have our developers working in their IDEs, they're interacting with Jira uh, for their sprints, for their issues. Uh, we've got contrast running on our product. If there's an issue, that issue is automatically created in Jira, right? Developers see that, it gets assigned out, risk level is assigned. Once they've fixed it, a notification comes to Slack, and it's automatically then populated back to our tool saying, hey, it's fixed. Uh, so like that whole process sounds amazing, but it's not easy to set up. Doesn't matter what tooling you're using, but I highly suggest find something that works for you. It may not be 100% perfect, but it gets you further down the road, right? But make sure that that whole thing, that whole process is as easy as clicking a few buttons to update all your different disparate systems, right? That's the whole, that's the, that's the key here. You know, be comfortable with whatever tooling you're using, integrate them well, and give developers that ease of push button fixing because the hard part is writing the code. So then maybe if you get to that point, <laughs> you can have a better feeling for what your current security posture is, right? Because that's really, to me, the key, like working with our compliance team, working with our sales team to be able to show clients that, hey, we feel pretty good about our security posture and here is why, and I'm not just handing them a report from six months ago from a third party consultancy, right? I can be like, all right, this is exactly where we're at today and print a report and, and send it to them. I think that's kind of the key. 
So this is the slide that I want everyone to take a picture of because it took me forever to put it together. <laughs> wow, you guys listen. You don't really don't have to, but so these are in my eyes where I see things going, I guess, right? Um, tools are going to continue to evolve. They have to. Because if they don't, they're just going to get thrown away and we're going to be up shit creek. Uh, you know, there is a lot of really smart people. There's a lot of really awesome tool work going on. I mean, we've, we've been looking at some uh, serverless tools. I don't know if anyone uses them. You know, they're, they're writing uh, AWS layers that help instrument your, your microservices and Lambda functions and things like that. There's some pretty awesome things going on. And, and that's only going to continue to evolve. Heck, Amazon and, and, and Microsoft and them, they're probably already working on it as well. Um, I think a key to this whole stack here is we have to figure out a way to enable developer self-sufficiency. And what I mean by that is we don't have the security people to continue to find all these, these security issues. So we need to basically make developers self-sufficient so it's easy for them to find them and fix them, right? Without even maybe doing security-specific testing. There's tooling out there that does this, right? Today, uh, whether that's building in some SCA tools, some IaaS tools, RASP, whatever else, but it helps developers basically become security people, right? Because we need it. We need it badly. Um, open source risk management obviously is a huge problem. It's not going away. It's getting worse. Um, I would love for everyone in this room to continue talking about that and getting together and figuring out how to make it better instead of just saying, oh, CVEs are shit, right? I mean, really, like, w as a security practitioner, we're really good about saying that's bad and then walking away. Of course it is, but let's fix it. Like, let's find a way to make it better, right? Um, you know, protecting legacy portfolio stuff is still important. There's still a lot of it. I mean, I, st I you know, in consulting, I looked at code that was 20 plus years old. So that's not going to go away. So whatever process and, and tooling we use, hopefully it will still work on some of those, uh, unless you're still running COBOL on a mainframe. Um, this, the, the optimized penetration testing is interesting, right? And I'm working on that internally. Like, I know what our tools are good at, so I don't necessarily want to spend my time and effort looking at those sorts of things, like SAS, DAS, IAS, all that. They've got specific things that they're pretty good at, right? XSS, most of them are good at. SQL injection, most of them are good at. And there's a list, right? So have some comfort level there, and then focus on the really hard things, like access control issues, right? Have the brains, the smart people come in and look at the specific issues or specific control areas that you, you know your tooling and your systems may be lacking, right? Because as much as I think tools are going to evolve, I think there's always going to be hard problems that tools can't help with. And I may be wrong. Hopefully, prove me wrong. Um, and then ensuring that continuous visibility, kind of the we know what our security posture is. Everyone in the company knows what our security posture is. Everyone knows our setup, our tooling, and all of that. Um, so this is really kind of AppSec in the modern world, if you will, in my eyes. And I think it benefits the whole company, right? I can't imagine how tough it is being a CIO or CISO in this world. There's a few in this room, I know, right? Answering to everyone. <laughs> uh, but if we follow this, this modern day process, we can at least help the CISOs, the C-levels, understand that we're trying to close that security gap and have them sleep better at night, right? Um, and then the security team, you know, every one of us has been in a position where we're working too much because we don't have enough help. If we can get a process set up where we're comfortable, maybe, you know, a 40 hour a week isn't such a bad idea or, or less. Um, and then the dev team, right? Instead of being the, you must do this, and not working well with them, let's enable them to work with us, 
right? And then ops, you know. Ops a lot of times gets kind of left in the dust and they're the last ones we blame. Uh, but if we get this system set up correctly, ops will just be streamlined into it. So I ran through that fast because we started late, Jim. <laughs> but, I know, I'm good. I was hoping. So what did we learn today? Uh, AppSec is hard. ICE is harder. <laughs> uh, fundamentals are still important. Like, let's not forget them. Sometimes we forget them because things are going so fast. Uh, but if we forget them, things are only gonna get worse as time goes on. Uh, tools help a ton and really are a key to your success as an org, uh, as a software security vendor. Um, but we all have our different needs, right? Like I know what my needs are and they're, they're different than GitHub's needs. They're different than Slack's needs and Microsoft and, and what have you, right? Um, but we can all create that process. Um, and build relationships. Like don't be the person, don't be Milton sitting in the basement, right? <laughs> like be there. Uh, you know, one thing that, that I love at Contrast is most all of our calls are video chat. For, for a remote company, it's amazing. Um, I used to be kind of against that, but I'm like, you know what, I like seeing the people I work with. And it's, it's a lot easier to talk to them when I can actually see them. So just a helpful hint of someone who's been in it for a while. So that's it. That's me in a nutshell. Yeah. Did you have a question, Jim? I'm putting a tool in a developer's hand to help them become a security professional or just become security literate. That, that, I think that's a great goal. How long do you think it takes a developer who's not been educated in AppSec, once you give them a tool, how long does it take before they start understanding proper remediation and the subtleties of, of triage and similar? So I guess that's a great question, Jim. Uh, I guess I wouldn't necessarily give them a tool. Like, I want the process to utilize tools, right? Uh, and then the developer probably uses the output from those tools, right? Uh, how long does it take them? <laughs> a, a while, right? Like, I think, you know, when it comes to understanding AppSec, there is a training component uh, when it comes down to it uh, that, that we have to definitely use, and I know you as a training vendor probably like to hear that, but. No, it's not, but I, I've always been a proponent of, of, of good AppSec training, and, and I think that's something that needs to continue. All right, being back on the customer side of consulting, is there something you wish you would have done differently as a consultant to help DevOps? Great question. Of course my answer is gonna be yes, uh, but I know that I never really would have been able to, if that makes sense. Um, in consulting, clients always had pretty specific needs, uh, and a lot of times those needs were driven by bodies outside of something that I could influence, like compliance or regulatory bodies or internal process. Um, you know. Thankfully, we were able to find those partners of clients that we could help with these sorts of things and help them evolve their DevOps process and building security into it, but frankly, they were few and far between. 